trying to remember my first, as you were talking, I was trying to remember my first angel investment. Um, and I think it was called, should I say what it's called? It was called Touch and Glow. Um, and it didn't go very well. The second one, however, was um, Screen Select, which then turned into Love Film, um, which we sold to Amazon, and that went a little bit better, or actually significantly better. Um, so um, I think what I'm gonna, um, you've sort of asked me to talk about angel investing and investing and scaling up and these sorts of things. So I'm gonna um, now I'm try to find my things, yes. Um, and I'm gonna play around with the word access, um, you know, access to investments. And I'm gonna do a little bit of micro about businesses themselves, and then I'm gonna think macro. I'm gonna go a little bit into short-term things and then long-term. Um, on scale-ups, really what we're trying to focus on a macro is creating an environment so that we can have more here than anywhere else. Because as investors, um, we really want ours to grow so that um, they, of course, all list on the London Stock Exchange um, or any other appropriate <coughs> stock exchange. So I just need to know a little bit about you guys first. How many, and we're going to start at the top, how many people here are policy people? Not very many. One policy person. Okay, great. Um, how many here are in finance or banking and that sort of thing? Great. Thank you. Um, and um, culture. Culture is sort of you know, education, media, that sort of thing. How many people are in the media or that, that way inclined? Great, thank you. Um, supports are what calls are law lawyers, accountants, these sorts of things. Lawyer, legal profession, accounting profession, supporting entrepreneurs, thank you. Um, human capital is universities and these sorts of things, fantastic. Um, and markets, um, like the stock exchange and things like that, so probably not too many of my colleagues from the stock, oh, there we are, thank you. good, brilliant. Um, great. So, and the middle one there, the middle word is really, really very important. And I didn't ask it first, but I'm going to ask it now. How many people here are entrepreneurs? Brilliant. How many people here are both an entrepreneur and one of those other things? Great. That's very good. Um, so a little, bit about, um, a little bit about my background. It's a Canadian accent, by the way. Um, <laughs> which is really, really very important and increasingly important. Um, <laughs> um, so I originally came over here 30 years ago as one of those imports from, uh, from Canada, went to the London School of Economics and met a role model who told me that I was an entrepreneur and I had no idea what, I was an, entrepreneur, what, I, what an entrepreneur was because I didn't come from that sort of background. Um, but um, eventually I was persuaded that I was one of those because I met quite a few and I thought, well, oh, that sounds interesting. Maybe I'm one of those rather than one of the other things. When I was in school, they were telling me I was going to be a social worker and then I thought, well, maybe I want to be a lawyer. Um, but actually, I'm really pleased that I'm an entrepreneur because um, it, it's worked well for me. Um, so I, before becoming an entrepreneur, I became a computer programmer and that worked really well for me as well, although I studied... Um, sort of economics and econometrics before I became a computer programmer. It's really helped me understand quite a few things. I went off to study at Harvard, um, which was also helpful, mainly because I met a huge number of entrepreneurs there, and it made me think that um, it wasn't that hard, and they seemed to be everywhere, and I liked what they did, and they were just solving problems that needed to be solved, so I decided I was one of those after having met a whole lot of them. Um, so first, uh, I graduated in 93, um, then I joined my first, so I co-founded First Startup with somebody else whose idea it was, then I moved on from there to start, um, start my own, um, and it sort of mushroomed from there. Um, stayed with the second one quite a long time until it floated on London and NASDAQ main markets. Um, that was there. And then, um, and then all hell broke loose. Um, and then I became a portfolio person. Um, and I was allowed to uh, think about all sorts of things. So I, I went through a bit of policy where I was ambassador for London. I did stuff with setting up Tech City. Um, did some st things with innovation launch pads, trying to get um, help the government understand how to procure more from, uh, from innovative startups. Um, 
and a few other things. I've invested in 55 companies now, and they're not all early stage any longer, but they were all early stage when I started, um, when I started investing in them. Um, I also um, have invested in some venture capital firms as well, because um, it's quite fun watching your, following your, following your money on. Um, Board of Raspberry Pi, which I absolutely love. Um, it's flying, it's got a, a dual purpose, both um, creating hardware that is really, really brilliant and used both by students and, and hobbyists and, and industry, um, but the structure allows them to um, create a lot of more donations for education around the world. And I, kinda, I like that structure. I think it's an interesting business model um, that I enjoy. SVC to UK, that's how I first met Syndicate Room. Um, Goncalo and Tom were uh, volunteers at Silicon Valley Comes to the UK. And there we were bringing volunteers. And Gary, you were one of the sponsors, weren't you? Um, so thank you. As you. Keep on your very good work. Um, and. Um, there we were bringing um, entrepreneurs to, to the UK and putting them in the classrooms of universities and saying, this is a really great career. career. You, know, you should think about this as maybe the best career possible post-finishing uh, post your studies. Um, so I did that for a while. I tried lecturing at business school. It's actually very, very, very difficult. Um, and then I tried a few other things, um, all of which have been really quite, um, quite fun. Um, and I think they taught me a few things. They taught me the difference between a startup up and a scale up. Um, they taught me how to make really, uh, I guess, how to learn from things that um, weren't all that successful um, and how to learn, per hopefully, from some of the things that were successful. Um, but the prime thing and the thing I want to talk to you about tonight is, is about scaling. I think when I was in business school, we talked about first mover advantage. Um, and I think when I first was thinking about being an entrepreneur, I was like, oh, got to get there fast, got to have first mover advantage. Um, but there's a huge difference between getting there first and doing it really, really well and then getting it to scale. And it's kind of a different discipline. And uh, I think that's, if I learned anything in the last 15 years of that big mess on the, uh, that big mess was focusing on the things that work and pivoting and focusing on the customer so that you scale and you keep scaling um, gives you as an entrepreneur a tremendous advantage. Um, if we're lucky enough as an investor, having an entrepreneur who focuses on the scaling and doing the things that scales is really very, very, very profitable. Um, and when you're an investor and you meet somebody who doesn't focus, and just gets excited about idea after idea after idea without pursuing them, that's not that great. Um, so let's, what is a scale up? We'll just pause on that for a second. Um, there's a definition that comes from the OECD, um, and not that I like quoting the OECD, but it's actually quite useful here to focus our minds. So after a company has been going at least three years and has at least 10 employees, if it's been growing either the turnover or the revenue for three years running without a break, that's called a scale-up. Um, and the reason why that's important is because if you can identify a scale-up, you as an investor or as a mentor or as an advisor can understand exactly what levers you need to pull in order to help them keep on scaling. It's actually really hard continuing to grow a company at 20, 30, 40, 50, 80% per annum. And after you've been doing that a few years, the wheels start to fall off the bus in very predictable ways. Now, the great thing about the wheels falling off the bus in predictable ways, if you know what those predictable ways are, you can put them back on the bus very, very quickly. Um, and we're gonna talk about buses and wheels. Um, <laughs> we're gonna stretch that analogy in all sorts of other ways. Um, so the point that I wanna make is it's not about size. A company that is, people used to talk, in the old days, people used to talk about small, medium, and large enterprises, or SMEs. I think SME is the most horrible word ever, and if you ever use the word SME, just stop yourself. It's just not a good word. Um, you think, I don't, I'm a business leader. It's like, I'm a SME leader. It just doesn't, it's not good. Um, and it's also silly, because in our world, the way that it is now, things aren't small or medium or large. We don't need snapshots any longer because we have trends. We've got a lot of data that allows us to see if they are growing or shrinking. Um, one of the things that I would love every student at university to think about is maybe you should just consider the growing companies because joining a growing company is actually a lot more fun than growing, joining a shrinking company. Um, but if they don't think that things shrink 
or grow, they might join something that's shrinking, and that would not be as fun as, grow as joining something that is, shrink you know, that is growing. Um, it can be any age. There used to be a, a time when people thought that it was just young companies that, that were exciting, um, but it's not. If you're in, say, life sciences, it may take 10, 11, 12 years before you get the science right. But once you've got that science right, holy crap, you have got the most fabulous international geographic rollout opportunity sitting right there. And if all the policies or the ecosystem is focused on young companies, then you're out of luck. Nobody's gonna help you do your international rollout because you're not young enough. So again, focus on, if it's growing, it's really, really good. Um, any sector, sometimes, um, and I could easily be accused of either being too tech or to financial services, um, but it's all sectors. If something is growing in a sector, it just means it's time has come and the entrepreneur and the team that they got around them have figured it out. Um, so we shouldn't be too sector specific um, because it can come anywhere. And regions as well. One of the, um, we, we're not gonna talk very much about Brexit or maybe we're not gonna talk about Brexit at all. We'll leave that to the questions if there are, if there are any. Um, but the regional disparity is something that uh, you know, happens everywhere. And sometimes there's a focus on just, just London. Um, but actually, these scale-ups are happening absolutely everywhere. And that's really good news. And one of the things that we're trying to monitor and make sure is that there's enough mentors and coaches and advisory companies like BDO that can recognize a scale-up when they meet them and so that they know what to do with them so that they can grow. And they don't necessarily have to come down to London um, for inspiration. And hopefully they can find it and other friends. Um, so we were talking about EIS. I'm trying to think what my first EIS investment was. I have piles of those papers. When is EIS, actually, when is EIS going to go just online and digital? <laughs> really quite cumbersome, the paperwork, but we don't want to go on that. Um, so what this shows is that in the UK, um, we actually got better at making startups um, than anywhere else on the planet in about 2011. And that's because of some of the policies and some of the other things. And that is, used to be celebrated as very exciting. And it is kind of exciting that we now start more things per capita than the United States. But um, some of them, in fact, most of them, don't have any employees. And if you're trying to stimulate economic growth, <laughs> uh, having a shell really does, does not do very much. Um, and if you're trying to get to be large, where you've got the productivity gains and innovation and where you can actually scale the thing up, um, you really need some to get beyond the small size. And we're doing a little bit rubbish on getting them past the starting up part. Um, and we want to do that because if we get a larger percentage of them past the starting up part, it is hugely advantageous for the city that they're from, or the country that they're from, or the let that they're from, or the local authority that they're from. Um, the whole nation uh, is the one that thrives if they can create policies that focus not just on starting the things up, and I know that you know, Syndicate Room is about early stage, but you really should focus on things that you think can go the whole way. And I would push you, um, if you're not already pushing yourselves, to, and if the entrepreneur isn't yet articulating that and able to think that through, I'd sort of send them back and think harder about what are they going to do to scale and how big is that market and how far will it go? Uh, because that is definitely good investment advice. Um, so scale-up businesses are the driving force of the UK economy. Um, often you'll hear small businesses are. Well, actually, I don't even know what a small businesses are and what if it's shrinking small business? That's not actually a driving force. But scale-ups that are growing, definitely driving force, and we should think about that. If we got just 1% more of our current scale-ups to keep scaling up in the UK, the value to the economy would be 225 billion over the next 10 years. And that's on a net basis. On a gross basis, it's 1 trillion 400 billion. And you know, it's not that hard if you can recognize what a scale up is to make it scale up better. So what is it that those things need to do? So how many scale ups do we have in the UK? Um, we have 11,575, um, which is an interesting number. Um, that's 0.4% of the business population, which isn't very much when you think about it. Um, but it's also very good because if they are about 225, let's say, in every city, 
then you can identify them, particularly if there's data around them. And if we know what we need to do to help them grow, that's also very good. It goes from a spray and pray marketing approach to small companies are investing to a targeted, let's find them, figure out which ones are the most interesting, how we can help them, and help them. Um, this here looks at the UK, the disparity in the UK, um, between how many scale-ups are there per city, and of those scale-ups, how many are growing um, quickly. And, you can, and to be in the upper right-hand quadrant is definitely where you want to be. We want to be there. So you want to have a lot of scale-ups as a proportion of the businesses in your, in, your, in your city, and you want to be growing them quickly. And to be in the lower left-hand quadrant isn't really a place where you want to go. Um, uh, at the Scale-Up Institute, we're creating programs to help city leaders and local government leaders who happen to be in that quadrant get into the other quadrant. Um, and the great thing is that there are programs all over the world that help ecosystem development people and, you know, and lawyers and accountants identify them and know what to do um, once they're working. We also looked at the business inventory that we have in the UK to see um, whether or not there was a healthy amount of businesses in each category. So do you have a good amount of companies that have between one and 10 million in turnover? And what about the 10 to 25 million in turnover? And what about the 25 to 50 and the 50 to 100? And for a healthy ecosystem, which is a dark green one, um, note where Cambridge is, by the way, um, you've, got, um, you've got a very healthy amount. Um, and you've got each category. And that's really important because the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is especially excellent. And what's happening here in this room with Syndicate Room and out in the networking earlier, um, it's really, really important to meet others who are a, a couple of steps ahead of you. Um, so you want to have somebody who say, you know, 100 million, you want to make sure that they come into contact with somebody who's 25 million. So if you're 25 million in turnover, you know some of the things you need to do to get a little bit further. Um, and that is, it's an important part. And that just lets us know here in the UK at a macroeconomic level, at a sort of, say, a policy level, where we might want to focus some areas where there appears to be a, a market failure. Um, the good news is there's quite a lot of green parts. So if you live in a green part, great. If you don't live in a green part, um, you can invest in a green part. Um, and we can try to help you fix um, some of those others. Some, some of the things that are really interesting is that we hear a lot about large company, companies and FTSE 100 companies. Um, I probably have to be careful since I'm on the stock exchange um, board. But um, we, little companies that are growing, create three times as many jobs as the FTSE 100 every single week. Um, but the strange thing is you don't necessarily hear about that very often. And the reason is because we all know that our little companies that are growing big, our scale-ups, don't employ PR people. We would really love our accountants to talk about how fast we're growing. We would love our lawyers and our tax advisors to do that. And that's one of the pieces of advice that, um, that, um, that we've put about scale-ups. Um, this just talks about how fast things are changing now um, and why there's an issue and I guess lead to what we can do about it. In the olden days, it used, things used to be introduced quite slowly. But in the world of um, social media, and software that can be really rapidly distributed via things like the internet, it goes a lot faster. And that's great as an investor. It's not so good if you're an incumbent because things can come really, really quickly and sweep you away. But as an entrepreneur, I take delight in thinking how one can disrupt um, those incumbents. So as an entrepreneur and an investor, that's exactly what you want. You want a slow moving, lethargic, large company to shrink really quickly because you're going to eat up what they're not uh, focusing on, which is a good thing. Um, so scale-ups are not startups. They've got different needs. The return on investment is much, much um, different. Um, and for the economic growth, if you think as a macro economy, if we had a million pounds to spend on a startup program or a million pounds to spend on a scale-up program, the ROI is something like 100x more if we spend that on scaling up and not starting up. So in the area of scarce resources, we want to be focusing on where our business model is really, really sensitive. Um, 
and part of some of the things that we've been talking about is just that. Um, so they're sort of everywhere. You can see them around, around the country. It's very easy with data to see where they are. Um, the first one were, those ones are both run by men and women. These ones are run just by women because um, you can see them because it's not so hard. We've got so much data. I love data. Um, so good. Um, here's some more data. This just shows what is the turnover per year. Are they all tiny or are there some big ones as well? And this just takes them by and it sort of plots them on a graph. This here shows um, the change in turnover from one year to the next. And these are real actual companies in the UK um, and how fast the turnover growth is. So you've got a, a nice mix. Um, this, again, turnover growth on the left and the percent growth. So you've got some breaking out there, some slow growers here. These are the ones you want to focus on, not those ones. Those business leaders there really need mentoring and coaching and helping and advice because they're bursting. Um, I'm going to skip that one. I have to make this point. I'm so sorry. Um, we don't have to look like Alan Sugar or Donald Trump. We could look like Sarah. Um, it'd be great to look like Sarah as far as I'm concerned. Um, but um, it's, not, it's not all about... They're, bo they're also run by men and by women and, um, and others. There's other categories as well these days. Um, in terms of the sectors, um, which sectors are growing fast and where are they? These are some of the women-led sectors that are growing on average. The scale-ups in that sector are growing at 88% per annum. That's pretty fast. That's a lot of hiring going on. That's a lot of contracts going on that they'd need legal advice on. That's a lot of um, everything that they need if you're one of their angels. Um, event services, like what we're doing here, internet, PR and comms. Um, these are some of the businesses that I just love their, uh, their leaders. They're quite fun. Blipper is EI, and, uh, sorry, AI, not EI, AI, EIS. I wonder if they had EIS, that would have been good. Um, again, you've got some manufacturing, you've got you know, sort of move guides, you've got food, food again, you've got sort of food, and, and then you've got, again, sort of technology and taking advantage of corporate learning and lifelong learning. Um, so what do we do if we want to get at least 1% more of the companies that have been started already over the edge into scaling? And what do we do to get a greater proportion of those that are already at 10 million in turnover up to 20 million in turnover? And how many of our resources are we thinking around this, this room? I, was, I, was thinking, I might go give, start cold calling you, Gary. Um, do you sort of bifurcate and say, well, do you have specialist teams to get those from 25 million up to 50 million? And um, do, you, do you check that? Because we probably should, because it's, again, it's different skills. And when you're putting together your events, are you making sure that you've got a table for 10, you've got a couple of, you know, sort of, all of them scaling up, but a couple who are a little bit later stage, and they can give some advice and have relationships with, um, with the others. Um, and it's really, really important. So drawing attention to scale-ups is really critically important. They do not employ, in general, people to draw attention to them. Um, but if we serve them in any way, drawing attention to them does them a lot of uh, favors. It allows them to, um, I guess, act as role models, which means children and people in university maybe might aspire to joining one of them because they've heard about one of them. They're not as scary if they've heard about them and understand what they're doing. Um, but it also, so it helps, uh, you know, and the converse of that is it helps them attract talent that will work for them. It also helps them get customers, and it also helps them get partners, and it also helps them get investors. And the importance is literally in that order. When you um, talk to scale-ups, the ambitious ones, and they're all ambitious if they're a scale-up, and you ask them what's preventing their growth, it's not that they want a vacation. In the media would have you believe that people in Britain just aren't ambitious, but that's just a load of rubbish. Um, what it is is they systematically find areas, um, barriers here that prevent them from growing. And it's up to us in this room to get rid of those barriers, rip those barriers out of their way as fast as possible. Um, so one of the things that we talk about is you can drive, we can all drive economic growth at a macro level um, by focusing on just that. How do we identify them? Britain's actually really good at the identification of them and um, we'll be getting a lot better. Um, because it's easier and easier to um, release this information. And the targeting, if we focus and we're alert to, well, I'm only going to invest in things that I think will scale, and I'm going to push them before I make that investment to show me that that's what they're thinking about. And also myself, I'm going to constrain myself as to if I'm going to help them after I've invested, 
I'm going to help them figure out the scaling thing. And if I see them maybe doing something that isn't so scalable, then we're going to have a chat about it. And maybe I'll get some other people around the table to help them figure out what they need to do that breaks that. Um, but it's really, really important and to evaluate the, um, the whole time. So releasing data is really important. Um, it allows all of us to do things a lot easier. If we can identify them, if we had a magic way of looking at an audience and just seeing that 0.4% and making it easier for them, that would do a lot of good for us. Um, helps them get the leadership. The number two problem is leadership. They find it really hard to grow that quickly and they can't find anybody else like them to help them. Um, and it's really important. Customers and partners, that's really what, um, again, sort of accounting firms, legal firms can help them do. And um, again, syndicate room as well, finance, which is what we're doing tonight. Um, and R&D and office spots. Um, science parks do a huge service. Um, and there's been a recent change in science parks from some who had wanted really long-term um, agreements in place with, with the, uh, the businesses that were there to saying, actually, we're just gonna give you flexible space and we want you to grow and we'll help you grow out into another place. And that sort of mimics and copies what's happening in other countries in science parks. Um, and there were some science cars that caught themselves doing evil things um, and they've stopped now, so that's good. Um, so in the UK, there's just under a thousand um, female run businesses that are growing at about 30% per year, um, which is faster than um, scale up businesses on average. Um, just under 500 are growing at 50% per year. Um, I thought we might plot some of them on the map in some of these cities, because one of the questions that if you're not from London, and I'd love you to think about is, who are your top 50 fastest growing companies and where are they? So that plots in the Solent where they are, and I've highlighted the ones that are growing at 20%. The data available in this country, which is absolutely fantastic, um, allows you to see who they are, where they are, and what they're doing, um, wherever they are. So this is up in Leeds, this is in Southeast, this is down M Enterprise M3, um, it's, all quite, it's all quite good. 82% um, of the businesses say that they could grow faster if they could find the talent that they needed. Syndicate Room, you were just talking about having operations in Portugal, and I said, why? It's like, well, we can't find the people here. Um, and we can find them elsewhere, and they're available. And the reason they're very expensive here is because they're very rare. Um, if we were getting more in the schools and the universities choosing the skills that we actually needed, that would be great for, um, for all, of this, all of us. When you ask what skills they're missing, they're missing business skills, they're missing management skills, they're missing technical skills, social apparently as well, um, and finance, and finance skills. Um, they're not missing, um, but our, I know it's quite sad, isn't it? Um, so anyway. Um, but those skills aren't that hard to, to figure out. And there's things that all of us in this room can do to help, help overcome that. Um, if you look at the CBI, which again has a mix of not just growing quickly, they've got some big companies that may not be growing that quickly, but even for them, it is the number one threat to UK competitive advantage, the skill shortage and what's coming out of our, coming out of our schools. And so what are we gonna do about it? So I'm just gonna sh whiz through a few things, the data, Anywhere we can find them. If we're an investor, this is a service that we created for teachers um, to help them find them. But to be perfectly frank, if you're an accountant or a lawyer, you can use the system and you too can find these, you can, you, you can find them. Um, if you're in Edinburgh, you're in Manchester, you can pop them into a cart, you can invite them into your classroom. We're trying to create a movement whereby it's really super easy to get business <coughs> leaders and entrepreneurs into classrooms so that children as early as eight or nine or, or 10 can think, oh, maybe that's a neat career. I never heard about that. Um, and I didn't think about it for me. And the teacher isn't necessarily going to recommend it because the teacher may not know how many entrepreneurs or business leaders there are. And they may think, well, I didn't choose that, that, that course. Why would that be one worth looking at? But 50% of the workforce works in small and medium sized companies. Um, and we just need to get more of them growing. It's a very likely, um, what did I just do? I did what I just did. Let's try it again. Um, just po poking through. This, I was picking up on this. This was an event that took place a couple of years ago in uh, the Brentford School for Girls, which is uh, an area in a part of London where they have 70% uh, free school meals, I think, a lot of free school meals. Um, and this was pulling on members of our community, people who were working at startups and scale-ups, and they just went in and talked for you know, a few minutes about what they were doing and why they thought it was cool, um, and it changed 
a lot of the children's lives. The teachers love it, um, the students love it, they understand that this is a path for them that they didn't think about. This particular student, Maitri, um, came and did some work experience for us at Founders for Schools, and then she said, can't you just create an app to make what you do for teachers work for like students? Um, and she planted that idea a couple of years ago, and last week we launched the thing. Um, and so what's really quite fun is that at all of the scale-ups, it is now avail it's now possible for students with a few clicks of a button to get work experience or an internship or to apply for that really, really simply, because you can find them and it's highly, highly relevant. Um, we know from the CBI earlier that this is um, a great thing to do and from the Federation of Small Businesses. I wish that they would rename the Federation of Small Businesses the Federation of Scale-Up Businesses. Haven't yet done that. Um, they've got some work to do. Um, but really what I see things like these apps and like these other information services are creating a pipeline of post-Brexit talent for our scale-ups. It's really hard getting talent. It's getting harder. It might get even harder. So we are going to have to focus on what's going on in our classrooms. Um, talent and skills, so there should be entrepreneurship in the curriculum. Um, there should be on the board of governance. If you aren't yet on a board of governors of a school, think about it. Um, scale up leaders again in a classroom, 50% careers, careers fairs. How many people here are parents? And do your schools have careers fairs? Yeah. yeah. And do they feature scale ups in fast growing companies? Lots? No. Um, well, it is as easy as a couple of button clicks to find the scale-ups to invite into the careers fairs, and if you're, it's not yet happening at your school, then you should let them know how simple it is and that it's free. It's, it is able to do for free because it's really, really important and there's a lot of support for it, and it's super important. Um, why do they have all these shrinking companies at the careers fairs? It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, it really doesn't make sense to me. Um, so developed leadership is super, super, super important um, because it's really hard. There's a couple of really good programs, um, but if you look at the top 30 cities in the UK, it's very, very patchy. Um, we probably need a lot of other universities uh, in particular to think about using their convening power to get mentors who have gotten companies to 50 million to talk to those who have got them at, you know, up to 10 and we've made a call out for business schools and universities in particular to think about what they can do to help, uh, to help with that. International expansion, the beauty of something, if you've got it working here, um, why not take it elsewhere and why not create, you know, easy methods to get something that's working here elsewhere. Sometimes it can be really scary. We have lower export rate in the UK than most other European countries. Um, and to me, that's just a leadership development opportunity. And there's some really good programs that are going, but we should, we should think harder about that. As angel investors, we should think about proposing for our scale-ups that they go on a trade mission to maybe India, maybe not America right now, um, but some other places, um, and um, see, how, see how that goes. One of the things we're talking about with local, with local government is helping them, providing them with tools so that they can find the scale-ups, because it's really hard when you're looking for 0.4% of the population to know which one is the good one. Um, but if you make it perfectly transparent and really simple to, for them to find, then they can get them onto, the, uh, onto some of the trade missions. They can, cr they can sponsor them for visas so that they can get some people if they don't happen to be able to you know, <coughs> come out here right now. And they can understand what they need to do in that community to stimulate their own economic growth, which is definitely in their, in their interests. Um, investment committee, I think, we, sorry, community, we should really talk about our scale-ups. And when they get a big contract, not when they exit, we sometimes are really quiet about our investments and say, oh, we just got an exit, we sold. It's like, no, why don't you talk about some of the contracts they're making or getting with X and, you know, X and Y and Z and A and B and C so we can all celebrate those customer wins because those are really, really important and they're good signals. It allows them to get talent. It allows them to get leadership development and other contracts. Um, some people have tried to convince me in the past, but and I know they're wrong because I came up with data. I don't have alternative facts. As a quite a shy... Quite a shy woman, I really need data and facts before I open up my mouth, unlike other people. Um, <laughs> um, so when you ask scale-ups, would you, know, you like to be identified and, you know, as a scale-up if you were a scale-up? Um, and 
97% of them say they would. Um, and that's very, very different from the, the ideas that there were a couple of years ago that said, no, nobody wants to have their information made public. Um, but actually, when you ask them, 97% of them say that they do. Um, and that's because they're starved for talent and they want some of the other benefits and fast track procedures that uh, they would benefit from if they could be spotted as the 0.4% of the business population that really does need the help. Um, media. Um, I can't remember where the, the newspaper and media people were. Um, if you did an analysis of column inches of whether or not you were writing about or even asking about um, whether you're writing about large companies or small companies or growing or shrinking ones, I suspect there might be a very large percentage of large ones that you were writing about. Um, and you might not have been writing about the ones that are growing. Um, and I'd ask you to think about, well, if they're the ones that are creating 100% of the net new jobs in the economy, maybe we should think about tilting it a little bit towards the scale-ups. Um, again, who here works for a large company? I don't care if it's growing or shrinking, and I know I shouldn't use it. OK. Um, so this year, when we surveyed the scale-ups, quite an incredible thing happened. For the, for the first time, um, getting procurement contracts with large companies emerged as a larger barrier than anything else. It's a 12-point jump, I believe. Um, so, and again, you hear lots of large companies have incubators and accelerators and labs. Those are not scale-up programs. Um, and what's really, really important are things like contracts that you have. So what we've got here is some recommendations for the large corporates and the accounting companies and, dare I say, the government and government departments, perhaps even the NHS, um, which is a call upon you to publish the amount that you are procuring from scale-up companies. Um, there was a huge change in behavior, and this is copying from the United States. Um, they started in the government publishing not the amount that they did with SMEs, but the amount of business that they were doing with companies that were growing. And part of what they had to show was the extent to which um, their contract was a proportion of the turnover. Because what historically, when they had their first policies for small companies or SME policies, it was just tell us the number of SMEs you're doing stuff with. So they did lots of stuff with um, people that used to work for them who became <laughs> consultants. Um, who, and 100% of their turnover was from, from the large company. But what you're really trying to get at with innovation is make, having contracts with innovative companies and making sure that you're not 100% of their turnover. And if you ask that question and start publishing it, um, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm looking at Jonathan. I think you guys did a fantastic, a very large contract was it with, um, was it Horizon? I'm trying to remember. You, um, Horizon, yes. yes. Um, and I remember seeing that and thinking, that's absolutely spot on. Big Cambridge company, uh, well now big Cambridge company, which you grew from zero, um, doing a very sizable contract. And you spoke about it, both of you spoke about it. So you didn't say, well, you can't tell anybody how big this contract is. Um, you can't wait to see if the thing that we're investing in works. You did exactly the right thing. And that is, that's brilliant, we should all do that. Um, so the next time, if you're a large company and you're um, saying, you can't tell anybody about this contract we've just done. Can you think again? Because that actually damages the company that you are doing business with. Um, and it is the number one killer threat to scale-ups now, corporate procurement behavior. So think about it. And I'd ask you people at BDO also, you just make sure, make, I'd, I'd ask that question. Um, so work finder, I'm sorry, we launched it last week. I, was, I, I wanted to give a plug. Um, if you want to go uh, onto workfinder.com, you can win a voucher for your child to get work experience at a scale up. Please think about it. Um, if it's not at your kid's school at the moment, then um, tell them about it. Use your invite code syndicate room because we will come back to syndicate room in a couple of years or maybe in a couple of months and let them know how many of you did something about that. And we will also let them know what the children did afterwards and how much, how much good came of that um, because it is really, it's an important thing to do. So I think that was my, I'm going to leave that up now, see if we have questions. Um, but maybe that will stimulate a few questions, that sort of meandering thing through, um, through everywhere. Um, but I think uh, you're, so Tom was saying, yeah, you can get back, come on. Um, um, you're sort of saying that um, 
some of these folks, so 50% of the people in the room were already making investments and maybe 50% of the room were thinking about it. About right. um, so I would encourage you to do more than think about it, even though the forms with EIS are actually quite scary. And that's, <laughs> that's got to be an entrepreneurial um, thing for somebody to do to fix, fix how difficult that is. But um, is there any, if you have any questions? Um, wait, 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 first. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Honestly. I'll do the former thing.